Good afternoon. My name is Robin Lee. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Hollow Gold. We are a Malaysian fintech company, uh, but I'm not here to talk about Hollow Gold today um, because we did our ICO last year. We started in the beginning of 2016 and we raised money through the traditional way where equity uh, investors come in and we built our platform. We had an MVP and in 2017 we did an ICO and it fundamentally changed our trajectory. It enabled us to look beyond Malaysia to actually start our expansion plan. So today we are expanding into Thailand, we're going to the Middle East, we're having discussions in Egypt and in Africa and we're having discussions in Mongolia because we have the ability, we have the firepower to look beyond a uh, domestic market, which for a lot of startups in emerging countries is a huge challenge because the capital pools that we have in country is relatively small. And that's what I want to talk about today. Now, what's really amazing about this phenomenon, and you've seen all these projects come up uh, over the last two days, is that the ability to raise an extraordinary amount of money for a startup has suddenly exploded. Last year, the average ICO raised about $15 million. In the first quarter of this year, that average has gone up to $25 million. Within the context of an emerging market startup, that's a huge amount of money that can be deployed that will enable the founding teams to focus on what they set out to do, to grow their business, and not focus on an endless round of fundraising, which is a huge challenge for all the entrepreneurs in this room. The environment that we have seen over the last 18 months has been one where if you just have a great idea, you can go out and raise money. I believe if I look into the future that this market is unsustainable. What I see is a more balanced portfolio of projects. Ones where there will be a, a group, of, uh, group of projects that will be just at the idea stage, but more predominantly a group of ideas they're either at the prototype level or in the case of Hello Gold last year, we were at the MVP level. We had an initial product, we had initial customers in Malaysia, and we had an initial partner. I see the model of ICOs moving towards that space, and for reasons I'll share with you in a short while. I think what we've seen last year and what we're seeing this year where basically it was very much a retail focus all these uh, all these projects come in with great ideas and they go up to market with just the idea and raising funds will be highly challenged and you're starting to see that this year in terms of the relative famine in the in the market today what will happen i think is a, what i call the hybrid model whereby a group of people come together with a great idea they go out and raise some initial funding through traditional means either equity or debt financing to then enable, uh, to enable them to build a prototype. What that does is to enable the initial investors, the VCs, the angels, to validate the model, to validate the, uh, the, the team that's going to build the model, and also to create that prototype. That will then enable uh, this team to then go out to market and raise the amount of cash they need, whether it's $15 million, $20 million, $50 million, to put away to then focus on the business of building their business. I believe that in the future, over the next 24 months, you'll increasingly see this type of hybrid model come into play in this space. And then, if you use this model, then the question is, you know, how, how, do, you, how do you create the kind of ICO uh, documentation that will enable people to buy into the project? And actually, in one way, it's actually very simple. To give people the same information that a VC would expect from you as a startup to give them, to give them sufficient information to enable the investor to make an informed decision. I think part of the challenge over the last, 24, last 18 months is that too many projects have given insufficient information. There is a series of best practices as far as I'm concerned in terms of what I believe an ICO should have. Sufficient clarity in the business plan, sufficient clarity in the technology roadmap and the marketing plan to see how you're going to progress this thing through market so that people can make an informed decision, as well as a clear sense of the use of funds. How are you going to deploy it? And also, more importantly, if you're going to go out and raise a crazy amount of money, like 15, 20, 30, 40 million dollars, how you plan to tranche it down? Because things happen. Things happen and plans change. So you need to be able to enable people to make decisions as to whether you have the right to draw that thing down against the deliverables that you set out when you first started. So there is a best practice 
view in my mind as to what will constitute a good ICO moving forward. And all these things are going to be very important because, you know, one of the challenges, so let me just go on. one of the challenges is that there's a huge amount of regulatory uncertainty right now. That will change over time. But as, but as of now, over the next 24 months, I think that regulatory uncertainty will persist, um, except in places like Gibraltar and Malta where they're coming up with specific ICO regulation. Which means that as people think about issuing tokens in this space, you need to make sure that you provide as much information as you can so people can make informed decisions. Looking ahead, I think that what you'll see is that more institutional money will come in, so it'll be less retail driven, which is good for the market because it means that someone out there will make decisions as to which projects they want to fund from an institutional perspective and in some ways guide the rest of the market as to what make they would consider to be good projects versus bad projects. I, think, I, I see a continuing shift from the west to the east because there are a lot of really interesting projects happening out in Asia. And I think that over the next 24 months you're going to see increasing regulatory certainty whether there's definition of what constitutes a security or not or more specifically and more hopefully what constitutes a good ICO offering in markets and hopefully in the case of Malaysia we'll see the regulators come to come to grips with this ICO space. Now coming back to the core question of why ICOs are good for emerging markets. One of the things that a lot of people touch upon in terms of ICO projects is the idea of democratization which is hugely important. If you think about us in Malaysia as all of us would have loved to have been an LP or initial investor in Grab, but we never got the opportunity because either we didn't know Anthony Tan or we weren't an LP and a VC. With ICOs, you have the ability to invest in the next big thing, regardless of where you are. And that's hugely important if we think about democratization of financial services. And I think that's a huge benefit for emerging markets and people in emerging markets to benefit from what's happening around the world. In terms of funding and liquidity, Obviously, the funding uh, benefits that ICOs are very clear, I've touched upon it, but more importantly, from an investor standpoint, as a VC and as a former VC, I can tell you this, is that you go to market, you find a product or a project, you invest in it, your ability to exit that investment opportunity is highly challenged because you have a security that has absolutely no liquidity. The benefit of the token space is that people have liquidity. You can choose to exit an investment at the point in time you're choosing and not at the point in time of the founding team deciding when they're going to have a liquidity event. This fundamentally changes everything for VCs. They, need to, they just need to get their heads around the issues of governance, which I frankly believe is overblown. But once that is done, I think what you'll see is the increasing VCs will come into this space. And last but not least, for countries like Malaysia, where our ability to build the next generation of industry, which is knowledge-based, tech-driven, is challenging. We have to bring in, bring in pools of talent and pools of capital because startups will go to where talent exists and more importantly, where they can get funded. And for many of us here, you know, getting uh, funding from an equity perspective is very, very limited. Our ability to challenge at a global level with the funds that we have available to us is incredibly difficult. I had a conversation yesterday with a VC and we talked about how much they wanted to invest in us. And they basically said our maximum is 100 US dollars, which isn't a lot of money if you're gonna pay for good tech talent uh, in this space. So how do we fix that? You can fix that by enabling us and startups moving forward to create a safe environment in a reputable jurisdiction with clarity of regulation so that they can raise funds through an ICO space and basically tap onto a global pool of liquidity, which means that they're no longer constrained by VC limitations of how much they can invest. You can go out to market and raise 10, 15, 20 million dollars, provided that you have the right kind of ICO with the right kind of documentation and the right kind of governance structures. And for that reason, I believe that if we can figure out a way to bring ICOs into this space, it will, in time to come, be a third way of financing for startups. Equity, debt, and ICO. Thank you. Thank you.